Welcome to Industry Leaders Journey, where we explore the lives and careers of conscious leaders who are making a positive impact on this world while they transform the supply chain and procurement business. My name is Su Shem. Sebastian Bao is a CPO at UCB, which is a multinational biopharmaceutical company headquartered in Brussels, Belgium. Today, you will learn how Sebastian uses his self-awareness as his compass in making important choices in his career. Let's begin this journey. All right, Sebastian, how are you today? Thank you for joining me today to share your story. I've been looking forward to this. Thank you very much for having me, Sue. It's really great and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great. So I've been checking your profile and uh, I wanted to start from uh, your first job because it sounded like you had a dream job for all new graduates. At least uh, I would have wanted your job. <laughs> you started at Thomas Cook, which is a, it's like a travel agency. What uh, is that it? And yes, so uh, so Thomas Cook is an uh, is a company that organizes uh, travels, uh, basically packaged travels um, for uh, people. So uh, it was indeed quite an interesting job. I mean, coming out of college. Everybody probably dreads the fact of having to spend nine to five uh, behind a computer screen in the office. And uh, I got the chance actually to uh, to travel part of the world and uh, spend my time on holiday locations and get paid for it. That's right. It's amazing. <laughs> but you didn't just travel, right? You uh, What did you actually do in, ta- uh, in the company while you're yeah, traveling? So, I mean, uh, to a certain extent for a travel company, Uh, hotel nights are uh, the raw materials that they use to build their products Uh and so uh, my role was to negotiate with the hotels and actually to buy beds uh, or to buy hotel nights Uh, and so uh, that we could then repackage together with an uh, an airfare and 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 sell as a as a product so I was responsible for a couple of regions uh, in the Mediterranean and basically I got to travel to these destinations uh, to do scouting, but then also to negotiate um, with all the different hotels. And I mean, sometimes it was just a small uh, bed and breakfast, but then you also had the big hotel chains that you were negotiating with. So very diverse, different cultures that you got to uh, deal with. And of course, like I said, you know, if uh, if you get to travel for a job to a holiday destination, what is there to beat? I know, especially in Mediterranean. Oh, my God. <laughs> but then why did you stop that glamorous job? Well, there's um, there's a number of things. I think, first of all, um, the fact of being away uh, a lot is really putting a stress on, on your personal life. Uh, I, um, I actually had just recently moved back to Belgium after being abroad for two and a half years. So uh, my now wife and, and back then my, my girlfriend, we, uh, we just got out of a very long distance relationship. Mm. Um, and actually here, I realized that uh, this was preventing us from allowing us to take the next step in our, in our lives. And, um, you know, I was um, finding myself in uh, spring somewhere in Bulgaria in the um, in the lobby of a hotel trying to arrange my wedding that fall wow. um, and I realized that that wasn't maybe the best thing to do and that maybe my place uh, if I think about the future life was also to be with the family and so um, I decided that I needed to do something which was a bit different probably. Right. I mean, it's so important to have that balance, uh, you know, in life for the work is important, but also what's important for you in life. So, yeah, the knowing the priority and value. So you shifted and uh, you learned a lot of negotiation and enjoy the moment. And then now you move to next company was uh, another interesting company, ABM Bath. Uh, yeah, so so yeah, tell me about that experience and culture of the company. Well, I mean, I, I don't think culturally you can find uh, a totally different company than uh, than Thomas Cook. Thomas Cook was actually a German company, so it was very uh, traditional and and hierarchical and. Uh, and then you go into this high um, high energy type of environment of uh, Anheuser Busch uh, InBev. At that point in time, it was still InBev because they hadn't acquired Anheuser Busch yet. But you know, it it, it was a company whereby um, uh, actually high achievement and uh, work was truly rewarded, and not rewarded just financially because I think that's. I mean, of course, it's always great when that is part, but it's rewarded in terms of opportunities that you would get. 
So it was, um, it, it kind of felt like in a, a mini MBA that you were uh, enrolled in and every day you had to solve a new case study uh, because that's how the challenges that were coming at you. And, you know, we were um, a group of young professionals uh, who really wanted to make a difference uh, in an industry that had been very traditional for, for, for many years. And so um, the company, uh, even if you look at today, it's, it's a company that has a stellar performance for many years, mm -hmm. uh, where probably you see some of the youngest uh, professionals holding key positions. And this is really because of the fact that you had this opportunity culture. If you wanted to uh, learn, if you wanted to make a difference, I mean, they would give you the opportunity and either you made it or, or, or you failed. It was, it was like in the... Um, a high risk, high reward type of environment, but it was it was great. I mean, the amount of things that I've learned there, uh, it was it was a great opportunity. Then, of course, it all accumulated when uh, uh, Inbev actually made uh, the acquisition of Anheuser Busch, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, then making the the largest uh, beer company in the world out of it. And then to be closely involved uh, in in some of the activities there, it was really a, a great opportunity for somebody who was. Uh, in his late 20s, early 30s. Wow, in such an early age, I get to experience that huge merger and acquisition. And did you also play the procurement role in that company? Yeah, so I, I actually started in procurement. We were managing the uh, non-commercial indirect uh, spend. Mm -hmm. um, but then I actually moved into the business shared services uh, part of the organization, uh, where I actually took a role of uh, a PPM. Um, and PPM is, is, is basically a combination between a financial controller and a procurement professional mm -hmm. that basically uh, allows you to uh, build strong relationships with suppliers. So in this case, it were our outsourced partners that we had, mm -hmm. whilst at the same time also managing the overall um, uh, financial aspect of, of the team and the overall performance of the service. So it was kind of an, uh, a hybrid role between procurement and finance. So that was really great because, um, I mean, for me, I've always been interested in those two fields, even though that my background, I'm actually marketing uh, by, uh, by education. It was really good to have that side because, um, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a real um, blue person. Mm -hmm. uh, from an uh, HBDI point of view. So I really like numbers. I'm, I'm, I'm really analytical. But then at the same time as well, over the past couple of years, thanks to all these experiences I had in procurement, I really valued and I learned the value of relationships. And this was a role whereby both basically accumulated, where I had on one hand the chance to be very analytical with numbers, mm -hmm. whilst at the same time uh, ensuring the performance of, of, of your outsourced partners through the relationships that you would build with them. Oh my God, I didn't know about that color blue. So what is that relationship? Is it red? <laughs> uh, so yes, so um, so you have uh, four colors in the HBDI. So red is emotional. So that's indeed the, uh, uh, the relationship part. Uh, blue is the analytical part. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and it's basically opposing the, uh, the, the red. Uh, so it's at two opposing ends. Right, right, and right. then you have the green, which is uh, call it the more uh, process oriented part. Mm -hmm. And that is opposed by the yellow, which is the more strategic uh, type of, uh, of thinking. Oh, I love so, it. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm sure everybody who's listening to this now start thinking like, what color am I? <laughs> it's cool. Well, All it's right. actually interesting because it measures your cognitive preference. Right. So it, it, it measures your default state, but yeah. it also means that you can actually try to be different in different type of, uh, of, of situations. Right. And from a, from a diverse thinking point of view, it's really great because if you're sitting together with a leadership team, you can say, okay, let's become green for a second or let's yeah. become yellow for a second. And everybody knows how they need to behave differently oh. in that organization. I love it. I'm going to use that for my team right away. <laughs> so um, that's very interesting. So actually you just mentioned the outsourcing and I want to talk a little bit about uh, your family background because I remember once when we talked about when you grew up, your parents were entrepreneurs, right? Just tell me a little yeah, well, bit more about that. So I think the entrepreneurship, especially on the side of my mom, has always been there. My grandparents, they used to um, uh, sell fish at um, farmer's markets. Uh, and so they were traveling the country until they uh, established an, um, a more permanent location where they opened up uh, their own store. 
so I think from that side, there's always been that entrepreneurial side, but um, actually both my parents, my, uh, my mom, as well as my dad, my dad's an engineer. My mom uh, was a teacher uh, by trade. So she was a high school teacher. But again, I think their, their path took them along a different direction. Uh, my dad moved for his uh, job uh, and my mom could no longer teach in the same school. So she started a, a business and that was at the time when um, you really had the revolution in the telecommunication industry mm -hmm. um, where it was the start of, of, of cell phones and then uh, later on then the more mobile phones that we have today. And so she jumped onto that and she started uh, growing that business. My dad then later joined the business and they further expanded into professional communication. So they've, they, they, they've really... Um, been uh, been on that path for many years and it it was something because if you hear the story about how they started it was it was so funny um my my dad actually bought one of the first cell phones that was available here in belgium and he actually went to a lobby of the hotel mm -hmm. and he would sit at the bar of that lobby and my mom would have to call him on his cell phone and then people around him would go like oh what's that what's that <laughs> And then he's like, well, it's a cell phone and, you know, I can, people can now reach me. I, I don't have to have a landline anymore. And then he say, oh yeah, but you know, I, I know where you can buy those things and uh, I have uh, connections and that's how they really rolled into it. And it's you, it, it's really interesting how from that, those interactions at the lobby bar, they actually turned out a, a, a big company here in, in, in Belgium. And so it's an amazing journey that they had done. For me, it has been a very eye-opening experience uh, at a very young age to be exposed to these types of things that um, that others might not see until actually they start working. Right, right. Is that is that the reason? Actually, at some point, uh, you started your own business. Probably, uh, I, I think um, you know. I've I've always had this entrepreneurial. Uh, um, mindset it always had something in my head about becoming right. an entrepreneur and you know I I was at ABI when um, I was going through again a, a personal life change I would say my my son was born and the company was pushing me to to take on different responsibilities potentially also relocating and I think that was very hard for me at that point in time to to really buy into that so I saw an opportunity that came by and together with uh, uh, with a couple of colleagues we actually created a startup that uh, was in our field of expertise so it was in procurement and and really looking at uh, tailspin procurement uh, and how to optimize uh, tailspin procurement you know I think for for me I also realized at that point in time that um, there were a lot of things that were not for me I know, I know it sounds weird to say, but I'm quite introvert. I'm I'm very good at interacting with people and people that I know with. I'm I'm, I'm very easy to to maintain relationships and all that. But I hate this whole cold calling type of thing and 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 like building out something. Like put me in front of an audience mm -hmm. and I will speak at ease. Ask me to in between or after the presentation go into the reception area where everybody is uh, there and start making connections with people and i'm just going to run because i i don't feel comfortable doing those things and so so um i also realized that that is a very important aspect of of entrepreneurship which just wasn't my thing mm -hmm. um, and, and and therefore the opportunity came along uh to join uh ucb uh, and that's basically when I when I decided to uh, to go back into corporate life. Right. Yeah, it's so important to like you have amazing self awareness. You know what works for you, not works for you, and then um, and then you go after what what you know what's the best. So actually, just for those people who are not familiar, what kind of disease uh, uh, you guys are actually focusing on? Yeah. So we we basically operate uh, in in the area of uh, immunology and neurology. Now, uh, more specifically on diseases. So in neurology, key focus areas are epilepsy and and, and Parkinson disease. Mm -hmm. On the immunology side, for example, it's more around rheumatoid arthritis, uh, osteoporosis, uh, Crohn's, uh, lupus, psoriatic arthritis. Um, so so. Uh, it, it's fair to say that those are are, are diseases which um, which really have a significant impact on on, on the life of, of of people. We have um, continuously tried to develop new and innovative medicines in these particular areas. 
uh, to hopefully uh, at one day even be able to cure some of these. Amazing. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. So I wanted to actually briefly talk about, I think you mentioned about this purpose of companies, the different and all. I want to hear your personal perspective on what do you think the purpose of life is? I think that's an, a very profound question. Mm-hmm. I think for me personally, um, I try to touch as many lives as possible. And touch, I really mean it in the broad sense of the word. And that's, I mean, if you think about it in a private life, um, of course, obviously you want to be a good father and a good husband and, and a good friend. But I feel that I can also impact the lives of, for example, um, the kids in my son's hockey team by being their coach and trying to teach them life lessons um, whilst they are just coming for their weekly hockey game uh, and, and trying to really touch them through that. But then also in, in, in an, a professional point of view, um, of course, again, the more obvious ones uh, around being a good colleague and, 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 and being an, uh, a, a good leader, um, it's really to use your position to again be a change agent. Right. to drive change in the world. Um, I think that, especially as of certain positions in the organization, you can make a much bigger impact than, than, than what you, um, that you believe you can. And I think this is really one of the things that for me, I mean, makes me want to wake up in the morning. It's really trying to make a positive impact in every interaction that I have with everybody and again in the office I'm, I'm participating as a coach and as a as a mentor for for people throughout the organization and there as well those are the elements where i get my energy from uh, it, it's of course you want to do a good job uh, for procurement but you first and foremost want to make sure that every interaction that you have with whoever that you try to impact that person that person will walk away with something differently than he or she had when they, did, they had not met you before. It's all very inspirational. You know, uh, I always had that uh, feeling since I've known you that you're really like self-aware and uh, like a deep thinker, you know? I don't know, maybe since we were young, like all the things, that you, all the decisions you made in your life and career path, it was like aligning with like self-reflection and the values that you're aware. So it's very inspirational. Have you been like always like this? I don't know if, if, if I've always been that way. Um, and, you know, I sometimes wonder whether people would uh, attribute it to me. Like my wife would probably say that I'm a doom thinker and that, I, that I'm probably a whiner on, on a lot of different type of topics. But, you know, for example, I hate my birthday. Um, <laughs> and the reason I hate, well, many people hate their birthday, but the reason I hate my birthday is because um, I always find it it's a confrontation that your time on earth is finite (laughs) i see because you know every day you're getting older but it's only on the moment that that dial changes from to the next year that it actually you're reminded that you're one step closer to your death than you are to your birth um and so that's that's why my wife would always say that i'm a, a doom thinker and you know i i typically on my birthday i don't want to talk to anybody uh, because I'm I'm extremely emotional. I, I typically also try not to be home uh, on my birthday, uh, be- because it's also a time where I really reflect. Mm-hmm. I, I I look back at the previous year at all the uh, achievements mm-hmm. as well as the failures that I've had, um, and and I, um, I I really try to understand uh, for myself how my p l looks like. Was it a profit year or was it a loss year uh, mm-hmm. uh, for me in the bigger scheme of things? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think the more I grow older, the more I do it. I, I, I don't think it's, it's there's like a, a pinpoint in time that I said, as of then I started to do it. But I, I, I realized that the more the years pass, the more significant the reflection becomes. Um, now, I wouldn't say that I'm spiritual because I, I actually grew up um, being more religion agnostic. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, uh, I uh, received a very open education when it comes to that. 
which to a certain extent helped me to be curious because I, I really like to learn about all different types of religions and all different types of cultures. But I would consider me probably more philosophical than spiritual uh, mm-hmm. about that. Um, you also wondered what we can do to, to bring this on to others. Right. And you know, I think it's, it's, that's probably the hardest thing. I think at first, you need to start doing it yourself. Right. Um, somebody who is not self-aware cannot make somebody else aware. Mm-hmm. Um, why? Because that the other person will see it more as you are talking down on me mm-hmm. if you give me feedback versus if you are self-aware yourself, you're already exposing your, yourself. So I, I think first and foremost, you need to start with yourself and start being um, open about it. Openly communicate in, in conversations that you have with your team or, or with your friends um, about the things that, that worry you. Um, and and I, I'm convinced that if you are authentic about those, you will by nature always uh, be inspiring for others as well. And, and people who will want to follow you on that path will follow you. Yeah, that's great, great uh, uh, wisdom that they are sharing. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so I'm going to shift the gear to now a little bit um, real issues that we are all facing, sustainability, and then uh, the, like we've been talking about the leadership in a way. Actually, once you told us, um, you actually also don't like the word sustainability. <laughs> so you're really challenging the norm that uh, you don't like the birthday, you don't like the word sustainability, but you're a big fan of a sustainability concept, actually. So why, what did you mean by that? Why do you not like that word sustainability? Well, you know, I, I, I don't like part of it which is sustain. Uh And and why is that? Because, um, like I said, I want to to touch as many lives as possible. And, and, you know, I hope that uh, one day I will be looking back at my life and and my kids will be looking back at my life and really being convinced that I've made a positive impact on it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I don't think that if we want to sustain what we have today, that that is bold enough as an ambition. Mm-hmm. And if you look at specifically on uh, whether it's environmental sustainability or even on some of the other topics like we have seen over the past couple of months uh, in, in, in the US, for example, it's not about sustaining what is there today. We really need to take a stand and we really need to step beyond what we have and we need to aim for improvement mm-hmm. and not for sustaining. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the word improvability does not does not sound as nice. And, and, and it's already great that many of us want to aim for sustainability, but I think we need to be bolder. And I think we need to really uh, go beyond and, and rather improve than sustain the world in which we live. Yeah. So give me some examples of what are you doing maybe in UCB as activities to, you know, improve the world? <laughs> Here, here as well, I think it, it, it's, uh, it's quite of a bold statement uh, to claim that we are uh, improving the world, but I, I think we're really trying hard to make a difference. And, mm-hmm. and I think this is, this is really what's important on, on, on one hand, whether it is for, like I said, the people that are living with severe diseases and how we're trying to make them their lives better. But also, and that's definitely an area where uh, we in procurement can really improve on uh, or can uh, help on, is on the communities in which we operate and the environment uh, uh, around us. Um, And again, there we have made very uh, strong statements as an organization, uh, whether it is to reduce, uh, for example, the uh, water and waste consumption uh, to be carbon neutral by 2030, um, on one hand, but then also uh, the ambitions that we have to really uh, develop and grow the communities, uh, whether it is by, for example, leveraging diverse suppliers um, uh, uh, in our supply base, as well as providing opportunities to uh, people who would otherwise not have an opportunity to, uh, to be actively involved in the workforce to really uh, have access to that. And again, I think it's, it, it's all these little activities that we do. Um, I mean, as, as an organization, 
uh, we do quite a lot of work uh, with NGOs uh, around uh, around the world, whether it is um, uh, through donations, but also educational programs to really try to make that difference uh, around us. So again, I think it's it's bold to say that we are improving the world. That I'm uh, I'm I'm really convinced that as an organization, we're really trying uh, to make a difference to ensure that people who need to have access to our uh, solutions and uh, really live their their best possible lives yeah i totally agree with you and uh, it, it is improving the world <laughs> well, everything what you're doing <laughs> i assure you that <laughs> so thank you for that okay so i want to ask you probably you know thank you first of all for joining our nsap life science value chain think tank i'm so excited to kick off this new think tank and you being the lead member here um and but people are wondering probably why you are working with sap on this think tank well would you like to add uh, your thoughts on that well you know i i try to participate in a lot of uh, networks out there um and that is really because uh we can't do it on our own we need to uh collaborate on this one um like i said um i don't want to make a bold statement as we are improving the world but we are making a, 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 a difference and i consider that with a um with a ripple in the ocean um we are not creating a tsunami by ourselves but we are all ripples in the ocean and i feel that if we put all of our ripples together that is going to create a bigger wave which will ultimately lead to a tsunami mm -hmm. and i think this is why it's important for industries to collaborate together and companies to collaborate together on topics which are so important to us right. i mean this is not about gaining a competitive advantage this is about doing what is right for the organization. And again, I mean, the extensive uh, relationship that SAP has with many of the leading companies in the industry is creating an extremely uh, important platform for us uh, and, and for myself to really a, spread the word, but try to make sure that we all um, uh, are inspired to make that difference, to create that ripple uh, and putting all these ripples together to ultimately lead to the wave. That's right. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, that's exactly our, our intention and wish that uh, it's not just about one on one customer vendor relationship between SAP and a, a company or customer. It's really bring that uh, customer connections, bring these amazing, excellent leaders and companies together so that we can create that ripple effect. Really, really uh, exciting opportunity here to work together. So um, I would like to close, and um, before I close, I want to ask you any other final comment that you want to add so that it can uh, just do, you know, call to action or uh, for inspiration for the listeners? Well, I think, you know, the call to action is very simple. You know, the tomorrow that we are going to live in is going to be decided on the decisions that we take today. So we need to choose very wisely today if we really want to make a difference in the future. Awesome. And final sentence, finish this sentence. I am optimistic. Da, da, da. Uh, well, I'm optimistic about procurement. Procurement is the greatest job or career that you can have. And I think that procurement can uh, really make a difference in the coming years in organizations. And so uh, uh, I'm, I'm really optimistic about the value that procurement is going to add uh, in the coming uh, Ten years. That is most awesome, optimistic uh, sentence ever. And <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today. And this was a truly inspirational. And uh, I am so excited to work with you throughout the year and next year, and uh, making true impact, the little ripple effect <laughs> together. I'm looking forward to that too. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Talk to you soon. The conversation with Sebastian makes me thoughtful. And I want to think a little bit today and ask this question to myself and you. Tomorrow that we will live in is decided on the decision we make today. How simple and how truthful is that? So let's ask this question. What do you choose today? Thanks for joining us on this episode of Industry Leaders Journey. This series is produced by the Industry Value Chain team at SAP where we are committed to making the world run better and improving people's lives. 
For more information and to access all of our podcasts, find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Reba.com.